just open in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, that we can be here today, Lord, in one accord. Father, I thank you we can hear your word, and we ask your Holy Spirit just to help us to put it into action. Convict us, Lord. Change us, renew us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week, um, I was talking very much about Naaman and servanthood, and that if you want to move in the anointing, you really need to be a servant, and the greater the servanthood, the greater the anointing. And of course, our reference to that is Jesus was the greatest servant of all. He loved us so much that he gave his own life for us. So one of the most important things, I think, about um, servanthood is doing it with a true, honest heart. And to do that, you have to examine yourself at times and test your motives. Why am I doing this? Why am I thinking this? What is behind my reasoning for doing this? And that's why you need the Holy Spirit, because you need to connect with him all the time to find out what is true and what is not true. Now, last week, if you missed it, it's on the website, um, but I want to carry on with the story, which is about a commander with leprosy, an inherited leprosy. And through servants... Not the king, not the people with power, but through the servants of God, this man received his healing. And it, said his, and it says his skin was restored completely. Can you imagine having an inherited disease like leprosy where there was just almost a despair, something you just had to live with, and then an expectation that through a servant he could receive healing. He needed a miracle. And his journey ended in a miracle. Simply caused by believing the words that a servant spoke. When we believe the words of the greatest servant, we receive a miracle. So let's pick up the story. Um, I'm going to pick it up from 2 Kings 5, uh, 15 to 16. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, this is Elisha, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. He refused the gift. Surely the most natural thing is if someone healed you, you would naturally want to bless them. And here we see the prophet saying, no, I don't want your blessing. But why? You see, there's always a story behind the story. Whenever you read the old, you've got to see the new in it. You see, if he had accepted payment, that meant he bought his healing. God doesn't want 
anything from you but your love. It's got to be genuine. He doesn't want you, well, I, I do this because God blesses me, so I bless him. That's not how it works. If he'd accepted that money, he would have felt, went away, I paid for my healing. You did this for me, I'll do that for you. That's very humanistic. But you see, Elijah's a servant of God, and he wanted to demonstrate the grace of God. By Elijah refusing payment, there was no alternative. The motive for healing was God. And Naaman was just faced with this awesome reality that it was God who touched him. And listen to his response. He was convicted by God. 2 Kings 5.17 If you will not, says Naaman, please let your servant be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifice to any other god but the Lord. You see, he suddenly entered into the kingdom. The kingdom broke through. You can't buy the kingdom. And not only that, he become convicted and convinced that all his worship of Rimmon, which was the god he worshipped in Aaron, was wasted. He wasn't even a real god. Now he become convicted of the real god. You see, you can't, even with acts of service, is not a payback to God. Great that we all do acts of service. That's, that's not a payback to God. It's a response to God. It's a loving response when you serve. He has, and this is the important thing, when you do anything with God, he has and will give you eternal life in heaven. You know, just think for a moment sometimes, when you're walking through the journey of life, you know, sometimes I think it's a bit like a mountain. You know, you start going climbing up a mountain. As you start, it's hard work. It's grueling going up a mountain. But your motive is to get to the summit. And about halfway up the mountain, you kind of, do I really want to get to the summit? Was it really worth it? And then as you get past the halfway point, you start to think, I'm actually enjoying the journey. I'm actually enjoying not just the summit, but I'm enjoying getting to the summit. And that's where God wants to take you to a place where you enjoy the journey. So whatever we do, he wants you to enjoy it. Sure, it's hard at times. Sure, there are boulders and obstacles to climb over, get round. But he wants to take you to a place where your eyes are fixed on the summit and you're enjoying the journey because you know where you're going. And when you get there, the view, oh, can you imagine being in heaven, what heaven is like? Your body doesn't get tired. Doesn't get hungry. How cool is that? To be strong, to be able to run and not get weary, just to get faster and faster. Imagine having a thought and at the same time, have an instant understanding of the answer. So all of a sudden, you know everything. As you think, the answer's there. You know. You know. Can you imagine that 
And then the beauty, the beauty of God, the light, the, in the citadel, in a city, living in a mansion. God has made room for you in his, in his, in his heaven. And he is the light. And the light, there's no darkness. Can you imagine any pain that you might have received just being wiped away? All gone. Nothing. All the mistakes, all thoughts, all memories of mistakes, all understood and completely forgiven. Washed away. Coming to the face of God and be able to look him in the eyes, eyeball to eyeball, and not be ashamed, embarrassed, or fearful, but just total acknowledgement of God in heaven. This kind of grace, it can't be earned. It comes through forgiveness. And I was trying to think, what would it be like? It would be like every day. Do you know when you go on holiday and you go somewhere really, really nice? And you kind of wake up the first day of that holiday and you go, oh, this is, this, this is great. I've seen the place. I can't wait to explore it. Imagine that feeling for a moment. Or your first day on your honeymoon, perhaps. Imagine that first moment, every moment of the day, you would feel like that. That's what heaven's like. That is where we're going to. And that's what we should set and fix our eyes upon. And so often, we look at the world we live in and we give it more credence over the reality of heaven of where we're going to. And Elijah wanted to make this point to Naaman. By refusing the money caused Naaman to see he was indebted to God. He had to come to a conclusion. He'd received his healing by nothing that he'd done. He couldn't even buy it. It wasn't because he was a commander. It wasn't because of his position. In fact, he was an enemy of Israel. He had raided Israel. He probably had even taken the servant girl that told him to go to Israel in the first place in a raiding party. He may have even killed her parents. He couldn't earn it. He had to come to the conclusion that this was grace in action. And then he just had to face the fact that all his worship all the things he had done in the temple was wasted on a God that had nothing, had nobody. So he asked for enough, enough earth for two mules to bring back. 2 Kings 5, 18 to 19. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimmon to buy down and he's leaning on my arm and I have to bow down there also, when I bow down in the temple to Rimmon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. And Elijah responds and says, go in peace. Before this encounter, he never even thought about walking into a temple bowing down to the God. Yet, an encounter with God suddenly becomes an awareness that to bow down to something else other than God is sin. And he asks forgiveness. I love the fact that he asks forgiveness. The Holy Spirit convicts people of the truth. When you act in love, you bring the kingdom of God with you. When you share a testimony, it is the working of the Holy Spirit that brings that reality and conviction that all the things that you thought your life was so sure about suddenly isn't. And Naaman realizes this, 
And he knows that he still has to bow down occasionally. And he asks for forgiveness. And I love the word peace, go in peace. Elijah understands that he's under the master of the king and if the king bows down, he has to bow down. And I love the way he says, go in peace. And the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And shalom means not just peace, it means total well-being. And I think in this case, it means in healing. So he's saying, go in your healing and that sickness is not going to come back. You've received it. It's yours. And even when you bow down, God will not count it against you because you've received that forgiveness. You've become aware of the truth. You've understood what sin is and why you became ill because of that worship of another God. This is what's on offer when you enter the kingdom of heaven. It's where you receive your miracle. And confessed sin, now catch this, confessed sin is never counted against you. Only unconfessed sin. And that's why we must always keep a short account with the Holy Spirit. You can't live your life without confessing to God your shortcomings. And the more you are aware of your shortcomings, the more you become dependent on him and his grace, his ability, his strength. And it's only then that you start to enjoy the journey. But you've got to trust. And you've got to confess Now, Elijah had a servant, and his heart really wasn't right. He didn't understand. He'd served Elijah, probably come a little proud, because it's a very high position to serve the prophet. And he also liked a bit of money. How could... Elijah take nothing from this man. You see, all servants of God, including you and me, we're all tested at times. Sometimes we pass, sometimes we fail. And sometimes in failure, we discover our shortcomings. But we have one strength, we can confess our sins. The most dangerous thing is to ignore it. And the flesh never wants to serve. It's only your spirit understands the power released through serving. And just like Jesus, who's so real, there is a devil. The devil is as real as Jesus is. His mission to kill, steal, and destroy. And he doesn't play fair. The devil never will play fair. He will never come at you in your strength. He will study you. He will find your weakness like a dam. If he can pull out one brick, the water will start to flow and do the rest and bring down the dam. But he sat back. The devil sat back. He observed Gehazi, and was about to release a word in his mind of hatred. 2 Kings 5.20 Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, said to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman. This Armenian, by not accepting him, what he bought as surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. I don't like this man. 
I don't like the fact that he's an enemy of Israel. I don't like the fact that Elisha has shown him grace. I don't think that's fair. And the devil put those thoughts into his mind. It's too easy on Elijah. Elijah was way too easy on Naaman. He's the commander. He attacked our country. We should retaliate. We should at least extract something from him. It's payback time. Behind the prejudice, if you peer it back, is a self desire of power and money. He wants the money. He wants the power. He wants the position. And he doesn't respect authority. If he had, he would never go against Elisha. Remember, all authority in the world is by God. It's God-given. When we rebel against authority, we rebel against God. Ultimately, he's saying, I know better than Elisha. And guess what? I know better than God. What a proud, dangerous place to be in. I know better than God. And in doing so, he's missing the whole grace in action. James 1.14 says, But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires. And Satan knows them. And he uses them to entice you to sin. All it would have taken was a bit of self-judgment. Why am I doing this? What do I want to gain from this? What do I hope to get out of this? Should I really be going against Elisha? Should I really not just ask him why? But he didn't. He didn't. Having obtained the silver, he rushes out to Naaman, obtains the silver, and then goes and hides it in the house. Let's pick up the story. He's rushing out to Naaman in 2 Kings 5.22. Everything is, is everything all right? Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two young, men, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothes. And you know, I suspect there was a truth in this. Because the devil always works in half-truths. I suspect two people did come. And actually, it's a kind of truth. He's serving his master, but his master's no longer Elisha. It's the devil. And really, if it stopped then, having got the money and got the clothes, he then went into the house and hid it. You see, when you have to hide something from somebody or something, it's almost an omission of guilt to yourself. If you judge yourself, no one should judge anyone else, but you should judge yourself by your actions. Does this line up? Should I really be hiding this? And the worst thing is when, it, when you go down a path of sin, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. So having rebelled against God, rebelled against Elisha, he then hides what he's taken. 2 Kings 5, 25. And when he went in and stood before his master Elisha, Elijah asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. What a lie. You see, he's protecting himself now. But Elijah said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money 
or to accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and herds, male and female slaves. Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and your descendants forever. Then Gehazi, Gehazi went from Elijah's present and his skin was leprous. He had become as white as snow. You see, sin caused him to lie. The worship of another God caused the sickness that was on an enemy of Israel. The grace to God's enemy is, to play, is depicted in this story and the true person who was the servant who served God and Elijah ended up in the position of being inflicted with the same sickness caused by the same reason, the love of money. And it caused separation, just like in the beginning when we separate ourselves from God because of sin. You see the parallel here that mankind is separated by the fall, the fall of Gehazi against the salvation and the restoration of Naaman. This is the old and the new coming together. And the thing he missed, he missed the timing. If only he'd asked Elijah, Elijah said to him, this is the wrong time. This is the season of grace. It's, he says, um, it's for grace, not the time to take money or accept clothes or olive groves. It's not a time to take. It's a time to give. It's a time to show God's grace. This is the time that we're in now. This is the, the era of time, of grace, to show grace and love and forgiveness. And he missed it. Sin brought name and sickness and God's grace brought him true freedom. God's grace caused Naaman's miracle and salvation. And the thing is, money without health is horrendous. I see people chase money and destroy themselves for the love of the love of money is a root to much, much damage. And if, if you love money more than God, it will destroy you ultimately. And in this case, you see what happened. Ephesians. 2.8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. You see, miracles, healings, work through faith by grace and they have to be received as a gift. So if you need something from God, you can't make yourself more righteous. I see people before, I mean, I, I sit out there just to steady my thoughts and focus my thoughts before I preach. But I see some people just having their holy huddles, praying, trying to make themselves half an hour spending with God, trying to make themselves more righteous, more connected to God. You're already connected. You don't have to do all of that. Because it's by grace. Once you understand that you don't deserve it, but it's a gift. It's your birthday. So I've got a present for you. Why? Because it's your birthday. 
Same with God. It's all received by grace. It's your birthday. You receive it. But I have to believe he's going to give it to me. So to believe it, I have to not only see it in the spiritual realm, but have an expectation, like Naaman did, that I would receive it. And then it's yours. Children are great with faith. Faith comes by hinting and hinting by the word of God. They love to hint when it comes to birthdays. And you know what I love about children is when they want something, they get it. They'll work mum and dad out. I want it. I will work mum and dad out to get what I want. And sometimes we need to work God out, which you won't. But you've got to have that tenacity to go after God. If your children never had that tenacity to go after you, they wouldn't receive half of what they get. Because you love them in the end, okay. You can have that for your birthday or whatever. Miracles work through faith by grace. And the the, the sad thing here is Gehazi threw away that grace. And in doing so, he received judgment. And if we don't judge ourselves, you become judged. Sometimes in the body, and certainly in the world, you'll be judged but ultimately by God. But when you judge yourself, you can hold your head up high. I don't deserve forgiveness, but I receive it. I don't deserve a second chance, but God loves me and it's by grace and by faith I take that forgiveness. By faith, I can now receive that miracle. By faith, I can see that breakthrough. By faith, I can reach out knowing God is going to take me through this. And I can begin as I climb the mountain, keeping my eyes fixed on where I'm going to. As I climb that mountain, I start to enjoy the journey, even the difficult bits. I'm waiting for God to show me how to get round the boulder or over the boulder or through the boulder. The difficult bits in life sometimes become the most interesting because that's when you're just totally dependent on God to guide you through those difficult bits. And when you look back, it's often those difficult bits where you've had your breakthrough that you've understood grace, working through faith, experiencing God's love and seeing that breakthrough. When you extend grace and love to people, you're challenging them, just like Elijah was challenging Naaman. You're challenging them. This is the God. You're facing God now. And you bring that conviction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, convicts the world of judgment. Not you, it's the Holy Spirit does. They realize the truth that God is in control. They realize their life doesn't last forever. They realize what's most important is where they're going to. And that's what happens when we bring the gospel message out and we share our testimony, our love, our grace, our generosity. As the offering, Pastor Sandra showed that video, it's more blessed to give than receive. Because when you bless others with no motive, no expectation, you're acting like God. And then you bring the conviction of the Holy Spirit with you. But any part of you in that, and you turn immediately 
into a Gehazi where you're polluting that love. You give me this, I'll do this for you. I did this for you, I expect this back from you. And that's a pollution. But when you do it unconditionally, it's pure love and the Holy Spirit will convict people you talk to. And then we have a home. We have a place we can come to and worship God and bring people and they can get saved and come into the experience of the living God. So let's get the worship team up. And sometimes on the way up the mountain, sometimes your eyes can come off the summit. And the moment your eyes come off the summit, you forget your direction of where you're going to. And when you don't realize your direction, life becomes extraordinarily hard. Other times you come to a boulder and really don't know what to do. You need a breakthrough. You need a miracle to get over this. There's nothing you can do. It can be in your children, it can be in your marriage, it can be in your work, it can be in your health. But sometimes you're faced with things you cannot do anything about and you need a breakthrough from God. And we're going to sing this song, Miracles. And it's a very apt song for what I feel the Holy Spirit wants to do. He wants to give you a breakthrough, a miracle in your own life. And I want you to come forward, and I'm going to pray with you to stand in agreement with whatever you want to receive from God, whatever obstacle is in your way that you need help with. I'm just going to stand in agreement with you. So let's turn down the lights. And when you're ready, during the song, just come up the front. When you say, no, but I want, before you come up, I want you to say, you've got to get to a position of, first of all, I don't deserve this, but it's by grace that I'm going to receive this. And I'm going to receive that through faith by walking to the front. And then when we pray together, I'm going to receive, and I know that the outcome is done. I may not have the total manifestation yet, or the total understanding, but I know it's there. And my eyes are set back on the summit. So when you're ready, come to the front, and we'll stand in agreement. Okay, worship team. Is that grace?